everyone. Today I am back with chapter 11 and 12 from the book Hatchet. There were things to do. He transferred all the eggs from the small beach into the shelter, reburying them near his sleeping area. It took all his will to keep from eating another one as he moved them, but he got it done and when they were out of sight again it was easier. He added wood to the fire and cleaned up the camp area. A good laugh. That cleaning the camp. All he did was shake out his windbreaker and hanging and was shake out his windbreaker and hang it in the sun to dry the berry juice that had soaked in and smooth the sand where he slept. But it was a mental thing. He had gotten depressed thinking about how they hadn't found him yet, and when he was busy and had something to do, the depression seemed to leave. So there were things to do. With the camp scored away, he brought in more wood. He had, he had decided to always have enough on hand for three days, and after spending one night with the fire for a friend, he knew what a staggering amount of wood it would take. He worked all through the morning at the, at the wood, breaking down dead limbs and breaking or chopping them in smaller pieces, storing them neatly beneath the overhang. He stopped once to take a drink at the lake, and in his reflection, he saw that the swelling of his head was nearly gone. There was no pain there, so he assumed that he had taken care of it so he assumed that that had taken care of itself. His leg was also back to normal, although he had a small pattern of holes, roughly star-shaped, where the quails had nailed him, and while he was standing at the lake shore, taking stock, he noticed that his body was changing. He had never been fat, but he had been slightly heavy with a little extra weight just above his belt at the sides. This was completely gone, and his stomach had caved in to the hunger, and the sun had cooked him past burning, so he was tanning, and the smoke from the fire his face was and the smoke from the fire, his face was starting to look like leather. But perhaps more than his body was the change in his mind, or in the way he was, was becoming. I am not the same, he thought. I see, I hear differently. He did not know when the, when the change started, but it was there. When a sound came to him now, he didn't just hear it, but would know the sound. He would swing at and look at it, a breaking twig, a movement of air and know the sound as if he somehow could move his mind back down the wave of sound to the source. He could know that what the sound was before he qu quite realized what he had heard, realized he had heard it. And when he saw something, a bird moving a wing inside a bush or a ripple on the water, he would truly see that thing, not just notice it as he used to notice things in the city. He would see all parts of it, see the whole wing, the feathers, see the colors of the feathers, see the bush and the size and shape and color of its leaves. He would see the way the light moved with the ripples on the water and see that the wind made the ripples and which way that wind had to blow to make the ripples move in that certain way. None of that used to be in Brian and now it was a part of him, a changed part of him, a grown up part of him and two things, his mind and the two things, his mind and his body had come together as well, had made a connection with each other that he didn't quite understand. When his ears heard a sound or his eyes saw a sight, his mind took control of, of his body. Without his thinking, he moved to face the sound or sight, moved to make ready for it, to deal with it. There were things to do. When the wood was done, he decided to get a signal fire ready. He moved to the top of the rock ridge that comprised the bluff above his shelter and was pleased to find a large flat stone area. More wood, he thought, moaning inwardly. He went back to the fallen trees and found more dead limbs, carrying them up on the rock until he had enough for a bonfire. Initially, he had thought of making a signal fire every day, but he couldn't. He would never be able to keep the wood supply going. So while he was working, he decided to have the fire ready, and if he heard an engine, or even thought he heard a plane engine, he would run up with a burning limb and set off the signal fire. Things to do. At the last trip to the top of the stone bluff with wood, he stopped, sat on the point overlooking the lake, and rested. The lake lay above him, twenty or feet, twenty or so feet below. The lake lay before him, twenty or so feet below, and he had not seen it this way since he had come in with the plane. Remembering the crash, he had a moment of fear, a breath-tightening little rip of terror, but it passed and he was quickly caught up in the beauty of the scenery. It was so incredibly beautiful that it was almost unreal. 
From his height, he could see not just the lake, but across part of the forest, a green carpet, and it was full of life. Birds, insects, there was a constant hum and song. At the other end of the bottom of the L, there was a large, there was another large rock sticking out over the water, and on top of the round, on top of the rock, a snaggly pine had somehow found food and grown bent and gnarled. Sitting on one limb was a blue bird with a crest and sharp beak, a kingfisher. He thought of a, a picture he had seen once, which left the branch while he watched and dove into the water. It emerged a split part of a second later. In its mouth was a small fish, wiggling silver in the sun. It took the fish to a limb, juggled it twice, and swallowed it whole. Fish. Of course, he thought. There was fish. There were fish in the lake, and they were food. And if a bird could do it... He scrambled down the side of the bluff and trotted to the edge of the lake, looking down into the water. Somehow, it had never occurred to him to look inside the water, only at the surface. The sun was flashing back up into his eyes, and he moved off to the side and took his shoes off and waded out fifteen feet. Then he turned and stood still, with the sun at his back, and studied the water again. It was, he saw after a moment, literally packed with life. Small fish swam everywhere, some narrow and long, some round, most of them three or four inches long some a bit larger and many smaller. There was a patch of mud off to the side leading into deeper water, and he could see old clam shells there, so there must be clams. As he watched a crawfish, looking like a tiny lobster, left one of the empty clam shells and went to another looking for something to eat, digging with its claws. While he stood, some of the small roundish fish came quite close to his legs, and he tensed, got ready, and made a wild stab at grabbing one of them. They exploded away in a hundred flicks of quick light, so fast that he had no hope of catching them that way. But they soon came back, seemed to be curious about him, and as he walked from the water, he tried to think of a way to use that curiosity to catch them. He had no hooks or strings, but it would appear some but it would somehow lure them into the shallows, but he would somehow lure them into the shadows and make a spear, a small fish spear. He might be able to strike fast enough to get one. He would have to find the right kind of wood, slim and straight. He had seen some willows up along the lake that might work, and he would use the hatchet to sharpen it and shape it while he was sitting by the fire tonight. And that brought up the fire, which he needed to feed again. He looked at the sun and saw it was getting late in the afternoon, and when he thought of how late it was, he thought that he ought to reward all his work with another egg, and that made him think that some kind of dessert would be nice. He smiled when he thought of dessert, so fancy and he wondered if he should move up the lake and see if he could find some raspberries after he banked the fire and while he was looking for the right wood for a spear. Spear wood, he thought. It all rolled together, just rolled together and rolled over him. There were these things to do. Chapter 12 The fish spear didn't work. He stood in the shallows and waited again, and again. The small fish came closer and closer and he lunged time after time, but he was always too slow. He tried throwing it, jabbing it, everything but flailing with it, and it didn't work. The fish were just too fast. He had been so sure, so absolutely certain, that it would work the night before. Sitting by the fire, he had taken the willow carefully, had taken the willow and carefully peeled the bark until he had a straight staff about six feet long and just under an inch thick at the base the thickest end. Then propping the hatchet to a crack in the rock wall, he had pulled the head of his spear against it, carving a thin piece of each time until the thick end tapered down to a needle point. Still not satisfied, he could not imagine hitting one of the fish with a single point. He carefully used the hatchet to split the point up the middle for eight or ten inches and jammed a piece of wood up into the split to make a two-pronged spear with the points about two inches apart. It was crude but it looked effective and seemed to have good balance when he stood outside the shelter and hefted the spear. He had worked on the fish spear until it had become more than just a tool. He spent hours and hours on it, and now it didn't work. He moved into the shadows and stood, and the fish came to him. Just as before, they swarmed around his legs, some of them almost six inches long. But no matter how hard how he tried, they were too fast. At first, he tried throwing it but that had no chance. As soon as he brought his arm back, well, before he threw, the movement frightened them. 
Next, he tried lunging at them, having the spear ready just above the water and thrusting with it. Finally, he actually put the spear in the water and waited until the fish were right in front of it. But still, somehow, he telegraphed his motion before he thrust, and they saw it and flashed away. He needed something to spring the spear forward, some way to make it move faster than the fish, some motive force. A string had snapped, or a bow, a bow, an arrow. A thin, long arrow with the point in the water and the bow pulled back, so that all he had to do was release the arrow. Yes, that was it. He had to invent the bow and arrow. He almost laughed as he moved out of the water and put his shoes on. The morning sun was getting hot and he took his shirt off. Maybe that was how it really happened, way back when. Some primitive man tried to spear fish and it didn't work, and he invented the bow and arrow. Maybe it was always that way. Discoveries happened because they needed to happen. He had not eaten anything yet this morning, so he took a moment to dig up the eggs and eat one. Then he reburied them, banked the fire with a couple of thicker pieces of wood, settled the hatchet on his belt, and took the spear in his right hand and set off up the lake to find wood to make a bow. He went without a shirt, but something about the wood smoke smell on him kept the insects from bothering him. So we walked to the berry patch. The raspberries were starting to become overripe just in two days. And he would never have to pick, and he would have to pick as many as possible after he found the wood, but he didn't take a little time now, but he did take a little time now to pick a few and eat them. They were full and sweet, and when he picked one, two others would fall off the limbs into the grass, and soon his hands and cheeks were covered with red berry juice, and he was full. That surprised him being full. He hadn't thought he would ever be full again, knew only the hunger, and here he was full. One turtle egg and a few handful of berries, and he felt full. He looked down at his stomach and saw that it was still caved in, did not bulge out as it would have with two hamburgers and a freezy slush. It must have shrunk. And there was still hunger there, but not like it was, not tearing at him. This was hunger that he knew would be there always, even when he had food. A hunger that made him look for things, see things. A hunger that made him hunt. He swung his eyes ac across the berries to make sure the bear wasn't there. At his back, then, then he moved down to the lake. The spear went out before him automatically, moving the brush away from his face as he walked. And when he came to the water's edge, he swung left. Not sure what he was looking for, not knowing what wood might be best for a bow. He had never made a bow, never shot a bow in his life. But it seemed that it would be along the lake near the, near the water. He saw a, some young birch, and they were springy, but they, slapped, they lacked snap somehow, as did the willows, not enough width back. Halfway up the lake, just as he stared, started to step over a log, he was absolutely terrified by an explosion under his feet. Something like a feathered bomb blew up and flew in fury of leaves and thunder. It frightened him so badly that he fell back and down, and then it was gone, leaving only an image in his mind. A bird, it had been, about the size of a very small chicken, only about a fan, only with a fan tail and stubby wings that slammed against its body and made lo a loud noise. Noise there and gone. He got up and brushed himself off. The bird had been speckled, brown and gray, and it must not be very smart because Brian's foot had been nearly on it before it flew. Half a second more and he would have stepped on it, and caught it, he thought, and eaten it. He might be able to catch one or spear one, maybe he thought. Maybe it tasted like chicken. Maybe he could catch one and spear one and it probably did taste like chicken. Just like chicken when his mother baked it in the oven with garlic and salt and it turned golden brown and crackled. He took his head to, di to drive. He shook his head to drive the picture out and moved down to the shore. There was a tree there with long branches that seemed straight. And when he pulled on one of them and let it go, it had an almost vicious snap to it. He picked one of the limbs that seemed right and began chopping where the limb joined the tree. The wood was hard and he didn't want to cause it to split, so he took his time, took small chips, and concentrated so hard that at first he didn't hear it. A persistent whine like the insects, only more steady with an edge of a roar to it, was in his ears and he chopped and cut and was thinking of a bow. But he would make a bow, how it would be when he shaped it with the hatchet and still the sound did not cut through until the limb was nearly off the tree and the wine was in, inside his head and he knew it then. A plane. It was a motor. Far off but seeming to get louder. They were coming for him. 
He threw down the limb and his spear, and holding the hatchet, he started to run for camp. He had to get fire up on the bluff and signal them, get fire and smoke up. He put all of his life into his lakes, jumped logs and moved through brush like a light ghost, swiveling and running, his lungs filling and blowing, and now the sound was louder, coming in his direction. If not right at him, at least closer. He could see it all in his mind now, the picture, the way it would be. He would get the fire going and the plane would see the smoke and circle, circle once, then again, and wag, waggle its wings. It would be a float plane and it would land on the water and come across the lake, and the pilot would be amazed that he was alive after all these days. All this he saw as he ran to the camp and the fire. They would take him from here and this night, this very night, he would sit with his father and eat and tell him all the things. He could see it now. Oh yes, all he... All as he ran in the sun, his legs slick with springs. He got to the camp still hearing the whine of the engine, and once one stick of wood still had good flame. He dove inside and grabbed the wood and ran around the edge of the ridge, scrambling up like a cat and, bl and blew, and nearly had the flame feeding, growing, when the sound moved away. It was abrupt, as if the plane had turned. He shielded the sun from his eyes and tried to see it, tried to make the plane become real in his eyes. But the trees were so high, so thick, and now the sound was still fainter. He nailed again to the flames and blew and added grass and chips, and the flames fed and grew, and in moments he had a bonfire as high as his head, but the sound was gone now. Look back, he thought. Look back and see the smoke now and turn. Please turn. Look back, he whispered, feeling all the pictures fade. Seeing his father's face fade like the sound, like lost dreams, like an end to hope. Oh, turn now and come back. Look back. See the smoke and turn for me. But it kept moving away until he could not hear it, even in his imag imagination, in his soul. Gone. He stood on the bluff over the lake, his face cooking in the uproaring bonfire, watching the clouds of ash and smoke going into the sky, and thought, no more than thought. He knew then that he would not get out of this place, not now, not ever. That had been a search plane. He was sure of it. That must have been them, and they had come as far off to the side of the plane, flight plane as they thought they would have to come, and then turned back. They did not see his smoke, did not hear the cry from his mind. They would not return. He would never leave, leave now, never get out of there. He went down to his knees and felt the tears start, cutting through the smoke and ash on his face, silently falling onto the stone. Gone, he thought finally. It was all gone. All silly and gone. No bows, no spears, no fish or berries. It was all silly anyway, all just a game. He could do a day, but not forever. He could make it if they did not come. He, he could not make it if they did not come for him someday. He could not play the game without hope. Could not play the game without a dream. They had taken it all away from him now. They had turned away from him, and there was nothing for him now. The plane was gone, his family gone, all of it gone. They could not come, he was alone, and there was nothing for him. And that's the end of chapter 12.